Welcome to Alive and Rockin'. For the next 60 minutes, we'll explore the Ottawa music scene through the eyes and ears of Ottawa's most prolific songwriters and musicians. These are musicians that enjoyed success locally, nationally, and internationally. There's a common element that exists in the music of the 90s that goes back to the 60s as far as Ottawa musicians are concerned, and the word is harmony. It's always been a big part of the Ottawa sound, and the biggest part of those sound came from three bands. Joining me in the studio for the next 60 minutes are some of the best. Originally of the Staccatos, and to go on uh, with international fame, is a member of the five-man electrical band, Les Emerson. Warren Barber and Michael Hicks from Octavian. And Brian Cooper of the Cooper Brothers. Les, let's uh, start off with the Staccatos, uh, uh, a band definitely that uh, harmony was a big part, and that continued. Yeah. Um, the Ottawa always had their own kind of sound. Like Toronto was um, an R&B, rhythm and blues kind of town. Montreal was to a certain degree, too. but and the French and English thing, but Ottawa was like a pop city. Pop music, well-crafted pop tunes with a lot of vocal harmony, like you were saying. Uh, every little band I ever had before I got into the Staccatos was kind of that way. We'd, um, you know, we always had two or three guys who could sing, but we never really explored it till the Beatles happened. That was what it was for me, anyway, and uh, what it was for most of the guys that I knew. When the Beatles hit, I was playing in kind of like a, uh, a country band, sort of, just right out of school, mm -hmm. and as soon as the Beatles happened with all those chords, new things that just literally weren't in pop music at that time. I thought, I've got to play that. I've got to go and do that. And so uh, a very good friend of mine called me and said, would you like to come and join our group? I actually took a drop in salary to do it, but they told me the magic words. They said, we're going to go and record. We're actually going to, they're going to take an honest try at recording. And I said, that's for me. Let's go. So that's how the Staccatos thing happened. <laughs> that was like about late 1964. And, uh, but you'd grown a little too big for the, for the local scene. You, you'd earned your stripes locally. You'd, you'd played uh, various clubs around uh, the valley, eastern Ontario, and it was time to move on. And the five-man electrical band, how, how did the group form? How did we played everywhere there was to play at least three <laughs> or four times. It was getting kind of uh, that way. Uh, about 1969 or so, um, we sort of went through some changes in personnel. Uh, one fellow left, another guy joined. There were five of us, two drummers, uh, Rick and Mike. Belanger, uh, Brian Rading on bass, Ted Giroux on keyboards, and myself on guitar, and we all sang. Mm -hmm. And about that time, we thought we had been what amounted to like a traveling jukebox. We right. had done everybody else's songs, cover versions. Every band starts that way because that teaches you, you learn, as long as you pick, you know, certain things that, that you really like. And we were like the Beach Boys and the Mamas and Papas, and of course the Beatles and things like that. That was our kind of influences, all vocal things. So we decided that we were going to stand and fall on our own songs. It was actually Brian Rading, our bass player's idea. He was always he says, pushing for something new. So not only did we decide to change our material, but we were going to change our name, too. And uh, because what was the point of if we were going to get booked under the Staccatos, we were, they were going to expect mm -hmm. the other. So we changed our name. And uh, along about that time, I had written a song called Five Man Electrical Band about a group of guys out on the road starving and you know, getting in trouble. And uh, we didn't know what to change our name to. So Brian came up with the ideas. Why don't we call ourselves Five Man Electrical Band? And there we were. <laughs> uh, definitely the band had tracks that were great for the time. Uh, Signs uh, was yeah. one of them. Well, yeah. uh, how, how, tell me about how, how you wrote that. I hear about people writing them on napkins and on shirt sleeves. Almost exactly What that. was the scenario for, for writing Signs? We were sort of, we were going down to California to record. We had weaseled our way into California. Some people were interested in us down there. We were driving nonstop from Ottawa to California. And I was sitting in the back of the car and we're going through New Mexico or Arizona somewhere. And there's these tourist things all along. It says 145 miles to Chief Yellowknife, and then 144 miles, 100, you know. Yeah. And I go, and I thought, gee, that's a shame. You know, it's a shame to do this with the scenery because you have rocks and mountains there. Look at the, uh, you know, the Apaches are going to come over the hill any minute and attack you. So I thought, that's a shame to do that. And I just <laughs> got this idea, and I started to write things down, and I put it in my coat, and I sort of added to it the next couple of days, and I was showing the producer some of the songs that we were thinking about recording. He says, have you got anything else? And I showed him this, and I said, yeah. Let's do this. So, and then it kind of came together in the studio, everybody's ideas. But that was a last-minute thing, and it never fails, you know? Song had major chart success. I think we've got some footage here. Uh, we're going to look at signs. So this is from our reunion show, 1986. Les Everson, the five-man electrical band, and this is Signs.
trespassing would be shot on sight. So I jumped on the fence and I yelled at the house, hey, what gives you the right to put up a fence to keep me out or to keep Mother Nature in? If God was here, he'd tell it to your face, man, you're some kind of sinner. And the sign said, yes, Les Emerson of the Five Man Electrical Band. I'm Brian Kelly, and we are alive and rockin', profiling Ottawa's music superstars over the next 60 minutes. Well, we're talking about harmony. This is a sound that continued for another Ottawa band and uh, a couple of guys that cut their teeth on uh, other groups that uh, led to the formation of Octavius, Warren Barber and Mike Hicks, but it went on to become Octavian. Warren? That's correct. Yeah, we uh, came up with the name Octavius uh, originally, um, but we always found that it didn't roll off the tongue quite right. <laughs> and uh, we were thinking of changing the name entirely, but we had a, a little bit of a problem because we had some press out there. So uh, we uh, had a job down in uh, the Niagara area someplace, I forget where offhand, but uh, we saw our name up in uh, lights and a billboard, and uh, it was uh, misspelled Octavian. So we figured, ah, that rolls off the tongue nice. So it stuck. Keyboards, keyboards are uh, definitely a part of the Octavian sound along with the harmony. Uh, Michael, this is, uh, we, we think, a little uh, portions of Octavian tracks, and certainly uh, keyboards have their place in the songs. Mm -hmm. Well, Les's band had two drummers, we had two keyboard players, uh, myself and Robbie McDonald. And when the band first started, I was 16 in grade 12 at Gloucester High School, and we were playing downstairs at the shot, and at that point we were doing Fifth Dimension and Association, mm -hmm. and the, the room would be full of bikers looking at us going, are you crazy? <laughs> what are you doing? For <laughs> but that was part of the legacy of Ottawa. I mean, the, we bands got their chops by singing complex harmonies. Beatles, Beach Boys. Um, we perhaps got, went a little too far and had to return return to the center before we started recording this. So. You guys had a chance to, to play uh, around locally, but you had a chance to do some tours nationally and so on. But I think uh, there's probably uh, one of your fondest memories uh, might be a, a gig in the summertime at Britannia Beach. Uh, can you remember all of that? Uh, yeah, that was a, oh, a wild event. That one. <laughs> one. Yeah, that was uh, July of 1977. Um, I thought it was just going to be a ordinary uh, outdoor job, but uh, it turned out that uh, my goodness, it must have been about uh, 3,000 people there. Uh, um, I guess the the uh, mood was just perfect that night. It was a hot summer night, sunset going down over the Ottawa River, and uh, 
people were just going wild. And by the end of the set, uh, all the girls were treating us like the Beatles, you know, and, and you know, I, I've said this before, but I think everybody should be in fear for their lives for at least 15 minutes. It's great, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they, they practically destroyed the trailer, and we had to have the police come and, and, and get us out of there. And that's one of those things that at, the, at, the, at that precise time, you go, wow, this is wonderful. But it's something that as time goes by, you get to tell your grandkids. You know? What was it like, uh, Mike, to hear your song on the radio? Wonderful. That must have been a special thrill. Yeah. It was a frustrating thing for me because there was a period of time that I was out of the band and that was the time that the Simple Kind of People album was put together. Um, but uh, when, I guess our largest hit in terms of sales, Can't Stop Myself From Loving You, in 77, uh, it was wonderful to hear that one. Yeah. But even when I was out of the band, I'd be calling up guys like you at the radio stations and going, can you play the new Octavian <laughs> song? <laughs> yeah, all these little contests that were going on. <laughs> but uh, but uh, being part of the scene, <clears throat> Uh, really, uh, must have been something very exciting. Just, just the travel, and uh, sure, it was, a, it was a lot of work, and uh, it might have been tiresome at times. But uh, being being on the road, traveling, and and just being out there, it must have been very exciting. Oh yeah, there's an awful lot of you know ap apocryphal tales about bands on the road, and there's always a perception from from folks out there that it's nothing but fun. But it's like running uh, a small business that any moment is about to give up the ghost. If a, if a light goes or a bass speaker in your PA system goes, that's your week's salary, goodbye. Ah. And that's, it was that tight. It was very difficult in the 70s because uh, technology hadn't really uh, bloomed yet and things were very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, bands at that time uh, were faced with a decision of um, buying a truck, buying a PA system, right. buying uh, a lighting system. Nowadays, technology is such that uh, you don't mind walking into a bar and using the, uh, the house system because you know it's going to be good. You just have to make sure that the man behind the board is good. Harmonies were definitely up front, the keyboards, and we're going to see that all right now. Uh, some file footage that takes us back to 1976. And this is Octavian, Can't Stop Myself From Loving You. Now when we broke up, girl, I didn't
one of Octavian's signature songs, Can't Stop Myself From Loving You, and some 1976 footage. You are watching Alive and Rockin' as we profile Ottawa's music stars, the musicians that had success everywhere, it seemed. And the big thing that came in the music was the harmony. Another one of those bands that we came to know and love in Ottawa, the Cooper Brothers, Brian Cooper is here. Brian, why do you suppose the harmony vocals, the upfront sound, such a big element that made uh, the bands uh, so well known? <coughs> well, uh, the guys were talking, there was a big influence, the Beatles and all that, but it goes, it goes back farther than that. Uh, every noon I can remember coming home uh, for lunch from school and there was a show on CFRA called uh, The Happy Wanderers. Mm -hmm. And even then, like it was country, but there was two and three part harmony constantly. Uh, so you just, we were brought up with it here. There were so many bands though that, that one hit wonders through the 60s and the 70s. And, and if you really had staying power, uh, strong lyrics and vocals, was it something you really had to work at? Writing, writing is essential even now. You know, you see one hit wonders now all the time. Yeah. Because the writing is just, it's so important and it is, it's not an easy thing to do. Quite often, um, you, you like to think that your material is, is original and you're recognized and, and people look at it and go, wow, that's great. But uh, sometimes comparisons can either hinder or they can help. And quite often, the name The Eagles uh, was a name that came up. Uh, there were comparisons between your sound and The Eagles. You both seem to have a, a country rock sound that, that was right for the time there in the mid to the uh, later part of the 70s. And yeah, it wasn't uh, like, well, we didn't take it as an insult. The Eagles, <laughs> it's not bad. <laughs> They're like The Eagles. But it was more, uh, we, we Sort of, we were very heavy into Poco at the time. Right. And that's where we got, and uh, like the same thing, the Eagles were influenced by Poco as well. And uh, eventually one of them joined. <laughs> 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 but you guys, you guys had a chance to uh, tour the country. Uh, some fond memories, I'm sure. Uh, great, uh, great, getting around. great memories. We did a, we signed with Capricorn Records from uh, Georgia, and they got us onto a couple of good, good shows. We did one memory I'll never ever forget is we did the Tampa Jam and we played with Joe Cocker, Seals and Croft, um, Atlanta Rhythm Section at that time they were the biggest act in the States and there was 55,000 people. In one show? Yeah, it was a football field. No kidding. The Tampa University football field was full of people. Crazy. Must have been an incredible rush, oh, the energy coming from that crowd. That. Never forget that. Yeah. Of course, you know, some of the smaller venues you know, the, the intimacy that comes with a smaller club setting, uh, you know. Yeah, there was, uh, we used to go play out east all the time, and uh, I can remember, I don't remember the name of the town, but it was a small town in New Brunswick, and 90% of them didn't speak a word of English. But we played there every time we went out there, because right. they were just so, it was intense, they were just sat there, every word, they were just staring at you, so we really enjoyed that. You know, the guys haven't played together on a regular basis in, in some time, but there was a reunion came up in 1986, it was a lot of fun for you? Yes, I got involved with uh, a good friend of mine, Pat Lowell, who's an Ottawa policeman. Um, he came into the local bar one night and he mentioned that he was going to put something together for the Children's Wish Foundation. And Les was sitting there with me and he mentioned another, uh, another big act that he wanted to get and we said, no, 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 we want to do this. And, uh, so we did it at the Civic Center, and uh, we raised $45,000 for the Children's Wish. Great show, and we're going to look back at a piece of that show right now. Cooper Brothers and Nor When I See Her.
I see her, the Cooper Brothers, from a 1986 reunion show in the Ottawa Civic Center. You're watching Alive and Rockin'. I'm Brian Kelly. Joining me over the last little while, for the next little while, some of Ottawa's best-known musicians, Brian Cooper of the Cooper Brothers, Michael Hicks and Warren Barber of Octavian, and Les Emerson, originally of the Staccatos, and the five-man electrical band as well. Here's a question I'll just throw out to all four of you right now. Why do you suppose Ottawa was such a musical hotbed? There, there were just bands on every street corner at one point. We never had a hockey team. I think that was part <laughs> of it. <laughs> Making up for it. Yeah. One of the reasons, uh, one of the reasons I think was there's, a, there's always bands in little towns, but in Ottawa there were a lot of places to play. I'm not saying it's so now, but there were an awful lot of places to play in those days. Uh, all kinds of different areas had community center dances, church dances, school dances. I mean, you'd go out somewhere, the scene in Ottawa in those days was, there was like two, three bands playing in the same place sometimes, and it was really a healthy thing. Today, to try to, for a bunch of young guys to try to get a band together, to keep it together, it's just economically uh, impossible. There's no places to, to go out and learn how to be bad or be good, you know? Mm -hmm. The days of the high school dance, which were really the lifeblood of bands like ours, it was where you learn materials, where you got a sense of, of a true audience reaction, because those people were the record-buying public, it's gone. It, it just, rare that a, that, a, that a high school dance has a, has a band. They have these guys with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> DJ says. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're right about that. There, there, there are a lot of musicians from Ottawa, but uh, they seem to base themselves out of larger centers now. And do you think there'll ever be a return um, to where bands can, can make a name for themselves here and, and, um, and, and recreate that, that time? Or do you think those times are pretty much gone? I'd like to think so. Um, in fact, I would like to really be a part of doing that. We're kind of working on something, but it's a little too early to talk about it, but we're just going to test the waters here soon with some new material and mm -hmm. some, some new people we, that we know. Earth is better. <laughs> 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 See, it's the old rivalry starting rivalry. again. Yeah. It's healthy. <laughs> it's healthy. I, think yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. The other great thing is that technology has changed so much. And when, when, when Les started recording, there were, there were a couple of good studios in Montreal and a couple of good studios in Toronto. Now, Everybody in this room has got home gear that's got ten times the quality that that stuff had in the 60s. You can master stuff um, in your bedroom. It's wonderful. No question about it. The state of the art is just, it's really exciting now. And it gives you the luxury of being able to sit there, like in the confines of your own familiar little surroundings, without having to watch the clock and the money ticking and going out yeah. the window. And at your own pace, do your record and do your music, make your music. In the old days, like there used to be the clock, tick, 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 and the, the board was like one big knob, you know, louder or softer, you know. That was about it. You just got it, <laughs> went at it till you got it right. Yeah. But now you can take your time. Live uh, off the floor, first take. Yeah. Of course, the radio scene has changed too. Uh, it's become so much more fragmented, and, and the markets are more defined and targeted. And uh, this makes it difficult, I suppose, uh, for musicians. You really, uh, you can't cross too many borders. You have to sort of stay with one space, uh, which in itself is very confining to an artistic person. I think. Yeah. I really, that's the one thing I really don't like about it, because you have to... The record companies were always trying to get you to do that. I had fights with a couple of the record companies over putting out a certain song, and it was always the song that sold the most, it seemed to me. They were looking for a boy meets girl, boy loses girl kind of record. And I, you're writing a song about an alien or a werewolf or something, and yeah. they said, what are we going to do with this? But it did well if they could only have the nerve to put it out. 
which is like this, and they were always trying to categorize you, and record radio stations like to do that too. These guys play this kind of stuff, and they put you in your cubby hole, and you better stay there. If you dare to stray, they won't know what to do with you, and maybe you just won't get played. Yeah. It's unfortunate that you have to drive creativity through the marketing process, but uh, there's only so many spots on the top 100, and there's a lot of bands out there, and that's really what we come to. It's become even a little tougher then, because there, there really are, I suppose, just as many bands recording now, or with the technology, perhaps, people are recording just on their own. I mean, one person can be a one-man yeah. band, uh, yeah. Brian, huh? Exactly. There's more people recording now because they're doing it like we're doing it in our basements. Yeah. You know, it's just too bad the Beatles didn't get a chance to use some of the technology we have. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. Well, one, one sort of interesting twist about this is with the formula-style radio stations that are out there now, um, we're, we're hearing our own tunes, you know, often more airplay t 10 years later than at the end of its initial run. And we're still getting royalty checks. Uh, yeah. Less has had a... Signs has been re-released by another band. Yeah, uh, sure enough. So that's one kind of interesting twist about it. Yeah, the old Goldie stations are playing <laughs> the old Goldie <laughs> tunes, you know. We'll take that. <laughs> there might be a few more people who have a few things to say about this because uh, some of your friends actually uh, are far away, but they are watching. And uh, some of those guys. Let's start off with John Alexander, who was with uh, Octavian. John? When I joined Octavian, um, I have no doubt I was the least musical. Uh, I mean, everybody else in the band were they were so proficient and learned in, in, in either their instruments or you know music theory or whatever. And uh, between Warren, Barber, and, and Bill and, and Michael and whatnot, they taught me so much that you know I had to like sit there and take it all in. But they got me started being very interested in in learning music seriously, and not just like getting out there and singing somebody else's songs or trying to sing our original songs. So that was a start for me. From the time I was about 17 or 18, I, I always uh, really liked the Staccatos, and I really I liked everything they did. And I liked, uh, I knew all the guys in the band, and, uh, and when they uh, changed their name to the Five Man, I liked everything they did then, too. I, I still like the band today. And we, I think we always tried, to, that was something for us to shoot for in the Cooper Brothers to, uh, to try and uh, come up with that same type of effort. The fact that you are living with six or seven other people seven days a week, 24 hours a day, everybody in that band um, had a fabulous sense of humor. Um, everybody had strong personalities and we bounced off each other like crazy. The fact that we got along so well and could laugh at each other and at circumstances got us through an awful lot of rough moments um, that may have have other other bands or other guys say well you know sod it I'd sooner be pumping gas I don't need this you know so I, I think that's what made it very special because you um, you wanted to go out and play. I got together and uh, uh, did some work with uh, Dick Bryan uh, a few of the other guys, Terry. Um, there was a keyboard player, Carl Schultz, and uh, Glenn Bell. Actually, Daryl Norris, who was the drummer uh, at the beginning of the, the band. We got together in 73, and uh, I was with them for about three years. And I dropped out for about another three years, did a degree at U of T in music, and then joined again, which was a good excuse to go down to Florida and record with them, since it was January and stayed with him for about another three years, till, oh, 19, maybe about 1981. You know, it was, it was probably a um, kind of a healthy rivalry, yeah, because Ottawa always seemed to have, like, one, one band, it was a five-man electrical band, kind of led the way, you know, uh, and uh, it did real well, and then all of a sudden there was a little bit of a void, and then Octavian moved in, and the Cooper Brothers moved in, so there were two bands kind of on equal footing, for a while, so I think there was a natural bit of rivalry, but at least I didn't see anywhere that ever between the bands became like a, a conscious, you know, we'll show them kind of thing, you know. Just because they changed the musical style more than the country mode to get away from what we were doing. As, <laughs> sorry guys, 
No, I don't think it was that we were friends. We rehearsed. I mean, we played gigs together and had a lot of fun together, so. Well, though I thought there was always a rivalry between us and, and every band. I would hope, anyway, that, that you know, there's a, comp there's a competitive spirit there. Um, we always tried to outdo other guys, but, uh, you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even think uh, Octavian and, and our band was, uh, was even in the, not even the same category. I mean, we, we did uh, totally different music. But, uh, yeah, there's a, we, I, I've always felt competition with, uh, with every band. Try to outdo them, you know, why not? <laughs> it's what they're trying to do to us. <laughs> always been impressed by, by Les' songwriting. The harmonies uh, really, you know, really hooked me. And um, uh, I was too young to realize it, but, you know, there was an influence there. Ottawa, uh, at that time, seemed to spawn good harmony band, so they were definitely an in influence. And early in, uh, in, in the 60s with the Staccatos, uh, the songwriting was there. I thought a lot of those tunes were, you know, for the time were pretty crafty. And uh, as far as the Cooper Brothers, it's always nice to have uh, some form of competition because it, it pushes you uh, to try and do better. So I just like to say thanks, guys, for being there at the same time we were. It wasn't a hindrance, it was a help. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. You know, the point was we didn't take that rivalry too seriously. We used it to our advantage in the long run. We tried to anyways. I think the concept of rivalry was probably something that people who were outside um, the center groups uh, were, were more conscious of than we were. Um, it's a funny thing, but uh, with, with musical bands, you never actually see each other perform because you're always working at the same time. So you tend to meet in social circumstances uh, more than anything else. Um, no, I wasn't really uh, aware of any rivalry. If anything, uh, it was just fun to meet, you know, guys who were in the same line of work, uh, who were who were as nice as the people in Octavian, you know. And I say that with all truthfulness. Uh, actually, uh, one of the guys from Octavian, Daryl, came on with us after a while, and uh, if you know Daryl, Daryl is one of the funniest, nicest guys uh, you'd ever meet. The thing, the thing about this business is there really is there is no roadmap. There is there's, I mean. Uh, having been through Octavian, had managed Luba or Sheriff, and I mean Sheriff with the number one record on Billboard magazine, and and having been at MCA Records, a major company, and worked with some you know pretty good artists and whatnot. Anybody that asked me that question about like, so tell me how do you do it? There really is no no roadmap for doing it. The only thing that will assure you don't make it is to give up, and the only thing that will assure that you at least have a shot at it is to just hang in there and believe in it. No matter how many people like myself or other A&R people from other record companies say, uh, no. You know, you said, I mean, if, if you give up because somebody else says no, then you probably won't cut out to do it anyway. If you ignore me saying no, for whatever reasons I might have, and go and prove me wrong, then at least you have a shot. Down in the private secret bar current company that we have uh, put together is called Fourscore Productions, and uh, it involves Dick Cooper, Brian Cooper, Les Emerson, and myself. And uh, we use, uh, we draw on the musical talents of uh, a huge stable from the Ottawa area. It's all guys that uh, we grew up playing with, and we still use them all the time for singing and playing, and, and it's just a lot of fun. The fans were fabulous um, and uh, terrific, terrific. Uh, our fans weren't pushy. They were, all, they were all so nice, you know. It, uh, it, uh, it, it was a joy, you know. It was a thrill being uh, liked, you know. It's, a th it's always a thrill signing autographs and uh, and uh, stuff like that. But the people were always, always so nice. So we just loved being out there. Naturally, like anybody's in this business, you love being out there playing in, in front of people. And uh, the response is very gratifying. And uh, the fans made it pretty easy for us because there was an awful lot of gigs we played that they just came out in droves. And if they were up for it, it just made the band that much better. Because if they were enjoying themselves, we really wanted to do 
too well, not only for themselves, but for them. We wanted everybody to walk away with, with a good feeling, you know, every time we played, so. I grew a lot when I was with the band. I learned a lot about the music business. I got a chance to travel a lot. Um, I learned how to budget my money. We didn't make a lot of money at the beginning. Um, I guess I developed a lot of relationships with some, some, you know, some good people. Um, saw a lot of the country, uh, a lot of the states, and uh, I expanded myself uh, personally and musically a lot. I don't think, looking back at after this length of time, that there's anything I really would change. It's it's kind of a memory. It's it's led on to something else for me personally. And although we don't talk as much as we'd like to, anytime any one of us get together, it's instantaneous. The years melt away, and 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 the friendship is there, and the camaraderie is there. So yeah, I guess, I guess I'm saying there's nothing really I would change. Couldn't do it anyway. So. Certain of You was the last successful single that Octavian released. You're watching Alive and Rockin', I'm Brian Kelly, and we're talking with some of Ottawa's best known and most successful musicians. Well, they say all good things do come to an end. Warren Barber of Octavian, did you sort of sense that it was the end of Octavian as a group when that single came about? Well, actually, that single is a good example because uh, Certain of You was a bit of a deviation for Octavian, uh, the um, type of material we had been doing up to that point and it's really an indication of what uh, was going on behind the scenes. We were um, starting to branch out into different areas as we were growing as musicians. Some of us um, were interested more in the country music. Daryl left to join the Cooper Brothers. Um, myself, I was taking more of an interest in hard rock music. Mm. Um, John Alexander was uh, taking an interest in uh, management. 
So it seemed to be a right time at that point to, um, uh, finances were very difficult as yeah, well, sure. as they usually are in this business. So it seemed, to be, the timing seemed to be right to call it quits while we were ahead. Brian, what about you? Did, did you have any regrets about when, when it ended for the group? No, I don't think so. It's, it's the same situation. The, the money thing was always very tight. I mean, you just seem to be playing for the sake of surviving, and that's not why we get into the business. We get into record mm -hmm. and, and progress, and it just wasn't working that way. So it was just time. It was go on to something else. There are always these paradoxes. You know, it's one of the most frustrating things about the business. I remember two or three examples of I'd be playing in an evening in Belleville, but I would have a half-day day gig uh, working at a car dealership just to make sure there was enough money to make, you know, I was a single parent at the time. We made the cover of the TV Times or the TV Journal, and I would love to have had enough money for 10 copies of the thing. That was $7.50. There's no question about it. You know, the, you know, it can be frustrating because you're out there working your butt off, um, doing the best you can, and trying to make the time to also record and write and live, but you don't have two cents to rub together. Yeah. Last year, you sort of you know, had the brass ring there for a while, and, oh. and did you ever think that maybe uh, if you had a, kept the guys together on a regular basis that there could have been another signs? Uh... Well, very, very difficult to keep things together when you get to a, to a certain point. And we had been together at that time for about nine years, over nine years, living out of a suitcase for like eight of them, and everybody had reached the point where <coughs> we were getting tired. we have been on the road constantly at that time for like a year and a half, You'd go out and you'd work like crazy for like four or five months so you could live comfortably mm. for same thing one and a half same months. Thing. Yeah, uh, you're, you're paying, you're paying roadies and you're paying managers and you're paying this and the other thing. A lot of reasons, a lot of things that were mishandled on various levels. A lot of it, some of it our fault, some of it their fault, whoever they are. Yeah. But it was just it was just kind of time to sort of drift and take it easy for a while. You know? We had fun. I wouldn't trade a moment of it for anything. But it, it, it was very difficult. It, have you ever noticed though? You don't remember a lot of the real bad times. Mm. After a while, you, you think of all the fun that you really had, you know, and it was. Oh, yeah, you know, kind of leading a bit of a gypsy lifestyle. I suppose everybody wants to so give up the nine, nine to five routine and just, you know, take it on the road and, you know, yeah. treat that life kind of casually, have fun. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> Pack it all I in. mean, you're all still all having fun, road. but, you know, you lived it, and a lot of people only think about living it, you know. If really. somebody said, you, you want to have another try at doing it again, we'd probably all just say, yeah. And just like somebody's paying a mortgage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you put the back door for a few more months, sure. <laughs> but being on the road, you know, it, it was uh, kind of a tough time. Uh, Brian, I, I mean, getting around it was a bit of a chore. It was fun to go from city to city, but I'm sure living out of suitcases after a while was, you know. Yeah, sure. And there's other things. There's uh, kids. You have kids and you don't get to see them. You don't get to see them grow up. I have one who's 19, and I missed his whole childhood because I was on the road for 10 years. Yeah. So I had another one, and I said, we're not doing that this time. <laughs> <laughs> so the Rock and Roll Cowboys are on the road again. Let's take a look at this uh, footage from a reunion show. 1986, the Cooper Brothers and stories of being a rock and roller on the road on Alive and Rockin'. <laughs>
on the road again with those rock and roll cowboys and you're watching alive and rockin and we're well we're in the studio that's where we are and we've been talking with some of ottawa's most prolific songwriters and musicians without a doubt uh, Les Emerson of the Five Man Electrical Band, Warren Barber, Michael Hicks of Octavian, and Brian Cooper of the Cooper Brothers. Guys, we were talking about you know beginnings and endings. Uh, you know, sometimes the ending signals the beginning of something new. Uh, Les, what sort of things you're doing? You're still doing the odd five man gig, but yes, what's sir. what's taking up a lot of your time these days? Ever since that reunion job that we showed a little clip of earlier, um, we had so much fun doing that we decided we'd play well, five or six times a year whenever we get asked to go somewhere. Uh, I'm still doing music. Don't know how to do anything else, so I might as well stick to it. Um, doing a lot of recording. Uh, Brian and I, along with Terry King and, and Brian's brother Dick, all have a little business in our studio. We do everything from music for TV, jingles, etc. But we're also recording some some of our own new stuff right now, which is something we haven't done in a while. So keep your fingers crossed. There's life in the old boys yet. <laughs> you haven't heard the end of it. Good stuff. Yeah. Warren, how about you and Mike? You guys are still doing some some dates and. Uh... Yes, uh, Mike and I are playing together in a band called The Fabulous Clichés. As well, we're uh, doing a little side project um, a studio at my place, uh, writing some songs and uh, trying to put something together. And uh, the project's called Was I Naked? It was, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, it, it's a fascinating thing because we're, we're writing music that appeals to us. We're, we don't really give a damn where it fits in terms of what radio station, <laughs> but it's beginning to... What's, what happens when you have that freedom and you're not really thinking about the demography and the psychography and all that stuff yeah. is, is the music's true and pure and, and fun. Mm -hmm. you know? but it, it, as time goes by, like, I don't know anybody, certainly none of the four of us would say that our voices are any worse. Our voices have gotten better. Songwriting skills have gotten better. Uh, I don't play keyboards as well as I used to, but I, I'm, you know, I'm, that's not that crucial. Well, you don't practice. <laughs> <laughs> I never did. <laughs> don't need to now. You can record in step mode. <laughs> it's true. The musical knowledge and everything has matured a lot. And we know a lot more than we used to know. It's true. Putting together something now, it's taken, it takes shape quicker because you've been through the process so many times before. You know. Brian, you uh, working with Les in the studio, but your brother Dick uh, doing a lot of film work and film putting and TV together some scripts, special TV yeah, projects. And that's keeping uh, Les and uh, Terry and I still play live together. Like Mike was saying, the voices, the voices stay the same. Like, you know, get sound a little more mature maybe but uh, we still got the harmonies happening we're having a good time reunions are always a special thing I've had some direct involvement with, with a lot of you guys in fact in the shows that have been done over the past few years and uh, uh, more reunions in, in the cards maybe I hope so. you don't want to rule those out oh never no. they're a blast yeah. no. too much fun yeah. we have too much fun and the people that come out enjoy them so much too I mean it's just a great feeling yeah. there's no pressure either. you just go out there for one reason just to have some fun you know? And for a good cause, usually. Well, it's really a, it's a good time to see some old faces and uh, yeah. you know, see some old friends come out. And, uh, Absolutely. You tend to put a little bit of pressure on yourself, though. I, mean, I think you sort of say, you got to be as good as we ever was, <laughs> yeah. mostly. Yeah. Well, yeah. When we did the Rock and Roll and Remember thing in 1977 or 78. 87. 87. He's losing his mind and his ability to play <laughs> keyboards, everybody. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, what was I talking about? Uh, we decided that we would do. We decided we would go right for it. We decided we'd do Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, Bohemian Rhapsody is one of the toughest vocal things. Queen can't do it live, but we, with seven guys in our band, we could do it live. And we said, hey, if we don't go out there and do that, then it, then it ain't worth even trying. And we did, yeah. and we nailed it, yeah. and that felt good. Yeah. Quick question, because we're going to go here soon. Brian, advice to an aspiring musician. Get out of it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? I must be getting old. Stay in school? <laughs> like, you, got, you, we, like you, you have to keep trying because you're going to get put down a hundred million times before you get anywhere. But uh, seriously, stay in school. Yeah. What would you say, Les? Education, education as far as, as getting as much knowledge about music as you can. If that's going to be your livelihood, then you better know an awful lot about it. And this day and age, you better know something about the electronic end of things and that, because that's where that's where the future is. The future is here now in music. But go for it because you never you never regret a moment of it. That's great. I've had a really good time talking with all four of you guys. Likewise. Mm -hmm. Brian, we'll look for you uh, to do other things. Keep your ears open. We've got some okay. stuff in the making. Mike and Warren, there's always more room on the turntable for your stuff. Uh, we have a lot of stuff uh, waiting for the turntable. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right. And last, we'll uh, look for some new signs of music. I from sincerely mean it. Yes, it's coming. It's going to happen. Yeah. 
been watching Alive and Rockin' on Brian Kelly. Till next time, keep it rockin'. As the years went reeling, and they go round and round and round, they go. Don't let them stop. They go.